So some of you probably know that this picture is a picture of a statue on the campus of Tuskegee University. I first saw it several years ago in Easter on our staff. You heard about Easter and Cindy, our pastors on our staff that do a lot of the ministry here at the church. But she's a um, alumni of Tuskegee. And when she went there for, I don't remember what the reason was, it was an anniversary, I guess, she came back and showed me the uh, bulletin that they made, and it had this picture on the cover, and I had never seen it before. And um, I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but you just have one of those moments where something just kind of penetrates into a deep part of your heart. And uh, the picture is Booker T. Washington lifting the veil off the eyes of a slave who has a book on his lap and allowing the light to come in. And well, it's just such a wonderful picture of freedom. And it, it just became a symbol for me of what deliverance is all about and what freedom in Christ is all about and what Isaiah 61 is about, what Jesus was quoting when he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. I've come to set captives free, right? That tyranny of sin, the tyranny of addiction, it's, it's a form of slavery. And, and in, um, in the movie Harriet, uh, they actually used a, a phrase the slave catching dogs. Like, boy, if you ever want a word picture, when the slaves would try to escape, they would send the dogs out for them, and human beings are being hunted like animals. But if you've never been in addiction, you might not understand that that's how it feels when you're bound by an addiction. It's the devil is the slave catching dog, and he's on your trail. And you would think, well, just if you just, just say no. <laughs> boy, wouldn't that be great if it was just that easy? Just say no. But we had opened up ourselves to a lot of ways that the enemy kept a hook in us. And until you repent of the sin that was involved, the hook can stay there. And that's what folks have been talking about. And that's why it takes courage to go through deliverance, because you've got to deal with some things that you've been putting off for a while. But boy, I'll tell you, if you didn't hear it today, then I don't know what else you need, but we'll keep praying that, that the Lord will give you that strength to face that fear, because fear is false evidence appearing real, right? You know that. And uh, I won't go into that piece, but this is just a wonderful picture if you get nothing else out of today. And I hope you get a whole bunch more out of today, but don't forget this picture. Okay? Because this is a continuing process for us as Christians. Yes, when we get saved, we're, we're a new creation, but we're babies. All right, and we're on milk, and we need to be nurtured, and we need to be fed, and, and we're told in the Bible that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, and that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind, so we, we hear it, and we can, what, what we heard today, it wasn't just theory anymore, she said, remember, when Latoya was up here, it wasn't just theory, now I was seeing it actually come into practice, that's what God wants for us, to take it from just an idea to having us walk out in it. And for me personally, nothing helped me do that more than to understand what the prophetic lifestyle meant, okay, was to have this really cultivated relationship with Holy Spirit, to stir up the gifts, to invite Holy Spirit to operate in me, to recognize he wasn't the ghost like Casper the friendly ghost that's drifting out up there. No, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to go to a temple anymore. We carry the temple with us, but it hadn't been fully developed in my mind. It, it, and part of it was because of the drugs that I did before I got saved. It, the, the, all I related to that was chaos and being out of control. And the prophetic seemed to me to be out of control when I first got saved and, and I was exposed to it. It wasn't, but it was just my lens that I was seeing things through. And it was reminding me of that lack of order. But when you live your life, you, you need enough transparency and innovation in the way you live your life not to be locked into a religious way of doing things. That's the best way I could say it. There's oil, right? Because the letter of the law kills, but the spirit gives life. And if we're only on the letter of the law, that kills. But if we're only in the spirit, we're floating off into the stratosphere somewhere and, and we're not grounded in the word. So that's why Jesus said, um, the father is looking for those who will worship me both in spirit and in truth. And in order for us to exercise that gift, we have to, it's, it takes courage. If you feel like the Lord has given you a prophetic word, the first thing we think of is, well, what if it's wrong? I don't want to steer anyone astray. But how will you ever develop that gift if you don't practice it? It's by reason of use that these gifts get developed inside of us. Or like uh, if you're a musician, you can't wait until everything's perfect before you do your first recital, right? Because the more uptight you are about it, the less likely you'll, you'll be to be able to perform properly, right? And this isn't even performing what we're doing when we lead worship. It's just ministering to the Lord. 
So you really have to be relaxed and open and listening to him and not be worried about what people think. And, and the less you worry about what people think, the more people will think of you. <laughs> and that's so ironic, is that if you be a God pleaser, that will have a secondary effect that people say, man, we need to get that person here because they know how to hear from God. And instead of trying to be, you know, so anxious about, well, you need to have me come and speak at your church. Or you, may, you know, you don't have to seek a platform. You need to have something to say. <laughs> when you have something to say, people are going to invite you because they want to hear what you say. And the more time you spend with the Lord, it's not grinding. It, devotions aren't meant to be this dull, grinding thing. Oh, I checked the box. I read three chapters, so I'm going to finish the Bible in a year. Really, that's not a life-giving relationship, is it? It's an excitement to get in the Word in the morning, and we've been focusing on that, and I will continue today, is every day you could pray, Lord, remove the veil from my eyes. Before I even start my day, before I even leave my house, before I get off my knees to start what I'm going to do, I want to start in a posture of surrender to you. I want to say, I can't do this without you today. Every day, say it, right? And I don't know if you heard uh, Emma Stark when she was here. We will have access to the videos soon. And she did, she did an outstanding job. And when there are eight different speakers, they all did an amazing job. Hers really hit me uh, for a couple different reasons. But she, you know, she was talking about prayer. She was talking about our, our, our lives being offered as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And then I forget who it was that said to spend, get on your knees three times a day. I'm sure some of you will remember. It was Emma. Okay, I forgot. I, I thought I was confusing her with somebody else. But like physically, that's the Bible method. That's what Daniel did. Three times a day, he got down and prayed. There's something about putting your body in a posture of surrender like that, that clicks with your spirit, right? That you're remembering, that's right. I can't do this alone. Uh, I don't want to even try to do it alone. All right, so uh, I'm going to keep going on the next verse here. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and at the top it says challenge, fading glory versus permanent glory. And I can't give you too much of the context of 2 Corinthians, uh, this chapter, Paul is being challenged by the people in Corinth. And it's kind of an insulting thing they did to him and, and said basically, if you want to come back, we're going to need a letter of recommendation for you. <laughs> <laughs> he birthed the church. He was the one that led them to the Lord. And then uh, another voice got in, a religious voice got in and said, Paul really doesn't have what it takes. He, he's not uh, Joel Osteen. You know, he doesn't have all of the package that you really should have when you're going to follow somebody. And I don't mean to pick on Joel Osteen. He's a man of God, okay? So I'm just saying, like, the big church and the TV show and, and all of the things that people kind of attach what the world thinks is important. And yet Jesus said, the things a man thinks important is an abomination to God, right? So it isn't about impressing anybody necessarily. It's about what you're saying. And Paul had a great revelation, right? So they were challenging him, basically. And in the way he's responding to them, he's trying to do it out of love. And he's saying, look, you have to be really careful that you don't go back to the thing that kept you in bondage in the first place. Corinth wasn't filled with a lot of Jewish believers, but the Jewish people that were having a hard time with Christianity were saying, got to be circumcised, got to eat kosher, got to do all these things that we've always done. And to you know, I can't even be critical of them because they were being asked to take a whole different pill. They were asked to swallow a very different pill, and not everybody caught it right away because that's what they were so trained in. But the warning for us is to live in this prophetic lifestyle that when God speaks to you, you better be aware that, of his voice. You have to know when he's speaking versus your flesh speaking. And they didn't, and they were challenging Paul. And he comes back at them, and he says, look, the fading ministry, he's talking about the Old Testament now, the fading ministry came with a portion of glory, but now, as Christians filled with the Spirit, we embrace the unfading ministry of a permanent impartation of glory. <laughs> you know what he's referring to, right? When Moses came down off the mountain, he had to put a veil over his face because he wanted to hide the fact that the, the glow that was on him was fading. Right? But we don't have to do that now. We don't have a fading glory on the inside of us. We have an active glory. Now, the, the brightness of that glory depends on how intentional we are about cultivating that relationship. Okay, And if we're very carnal in our Christianity, then the Lord can't connect with that. So he's in there, but he's not, we're not letting him out. We haven't surrendered enough to say, Lord, not your will. Not my will, sorry, that was a bad mistake, right? Not my will, but yours be done. I just want to be a reflection of who you are. I want to get out of the way, like we pray. Sing through us. 
Preach through us. You speak. When I open my mouth, let it be you speaking through me. No matter what the situation is, you'll always win. When he answers that prayer, you always win. So verse 12 says, with this amazing hope in us, we step out in freedom and boldness to speak the truth. We're not like Moses who used the veil to hide the glory to keep the Israelites from staring at him as it was. And that's what religion does. It fades. It gives you a structure. It gives you the appearance of holiness, but without the substance of the real true holiness, which is this need to be an active, open dialogue with the Lord at all times so that you know what to do. That's what it says about the sons of Issachar, right? They knew the times and the seasons, and they knew what Israel should do. That's a prophetic mantle. And that requires a real strong cultivation of knowing how to hear the voice of the Lord. Because the voice of man many times will contradict the voice of the Lord. So you better know how to hear his voice. Amen? Amen. Verse 14, even to this day, Paul is writing in 2 Corinthians 3, the same veil comes over their minds when they hear the words of the former covenant. That's the Old Testament. The veil has not yet been lifted from them, for it's only eliminated when one is joined to the Messiah. Okay, that's uh, Passion Translation. He's referring back to a promise that was made that a lot of the Jews of Jesus' day would have known. Jeremiah chapter 31. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. Come on, say it with me. When I will make a... All right, this is all the way back at Jeremiah. Now, if you know anything about him, he was called the weeping prophet for a reason because Israel was about to go under terrible judgment. They were about to go into exile. And yet this man of God was able to write down a promise in the midst of that terrible situation that they were in and say, but behold, the Lord says, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is you receiving the very spirit of Jesus right on the inside of you. And the word in Revelation says that the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, right? I don't think I'm quoting it exactly right right now, but there's a connection there. Prophecy doesn't have to be, thus saith the Lord, in King James language. It's you understanding a prophetic lifestyle means I'm staying in communion with him because I need that GPS. He's got to be directing the GPS, not my flesh. But my flesh is always trying to to bump him out of the pilot seat and move over from the co-pilot seat and say, I know how to do this better than you do. And you got to tell your flesh, no, no, you don't. We were crashing when you were flying the plane. (laughs) We need to let him fly the plane. He put his law right in their minds and wrote it on their hearts. I'll be their people, their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 34, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. For they are All shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. So back to our chapter, uh, actually the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians, we took from 2 Corinthians, but just a reminder of the power of what's on the inside of us. Paul, again, in 1 Corinthians 2, is writing, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. How many here fit that bill? You love him. Right? And he does exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or imagine. And this is a quote from the Old Testament. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But here's one of those but gods in the Bible, right? But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. All right, so we really want to actively cultivate our relationship with Holy Spirit. We want to welcome him in the morning. We don't want to assume he doesn't care about the trivial things that we deal with. He does. He cares about it all. Jesus cares about us. That's why he gave us his spirit to live right on the inside of us. It's revealed by his spirit. For the spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. That's worth repeating. The Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. When you're not sure about how to solve a problem on your job, would God want to help you? Why? You're his kid. He wants you to prosper. When Latoya got promoted or got that new raise, do you think he was like, oh, no, this is going to pull her further away from me? No, it's going to be like, wow. She got a promotion. She's going to be a light for me. And the more money she makes, she's a giver. She's going to give more. 
So why wouldn't he want to, if he knows he could trust you, that's the thing, right? He's got to know that you're, you're a trustworthy vessel. And again, that's, that could sound like a works mentality. I don't mean it to. I'm just saying, why wouldn't he meet you where he's, his request is, live with me. Love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. And then the only way you can do the next greatest to love your neighbor as yourself is if you do the first one. Because when you love him, you have a light shining on the inside of you. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever notice how Christians seem like they're glowing sometimes? Yeah, radiant. It, they use the word illuminate in some translations in the Bible. When I was illuminated, it means when I got saved, a light went on on the inside of me. And the dark people, the people that don't know the Lord around you, they're soaking in that light. And the more you can emanate, the more you're soaking in. And you're building up their light on the inside. And maybe just hoping, I, I keep trying to find something wrong with this person, but they keep telling the truth, right? I told you, my sister-in-law, Linda, at her job, that's how she is. She's just emanating light. And no matter how much darkness is there, they soak it up. She's still throwing out more light and witnessing to everybody she talks to. Isn't it a wonderful gift? But that's, that's meant for all of us. Let your light shine. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. And then in Romans 8, wow, what a wonderful promise that we have. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, comes alongside and helps us in our weakness. How many need that? <laughs> Hello? We all do. We don't know what to pray for as we ought to. But the same Spirit pleads on our behalf with groanings. I'm sorry, with groanings too deep for words. All right? So when you're not sure how to articulate, you turn it over to him and say, pray through me in the Spirit. Holy Spirit, pray through me to the Father. You know what the solution to this problem is. I don't yet, and I don't even know how to pray, but you do. So I'm submitting to you to pray with me. And then it says the searcher of the hearts, that's the Father, knows what the Spirit is thinking because the Spirit pleads for God's people according to God's will. Why wouldn't we want to cultivate this relationship? He wants to be a very personal help in time of trouble, a present help right there for us, always available, always on duty, yeah. even working while you're sleeping. Because yeah. some of us are too thick while we're awake. <laughs> We gotta get to our slumbering spirit because that's when we finally have our ears open. He'll do it. He loves us. He leaves the 99. The overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. He chases me down, fights till I'm found. Woo! Couldn't earn it. Don't deserve it. But he still chases me down. <laughs> so, this is the fuller verse of where we took our text from about the veil being lifted off her eyes. It's such an amazing picture of freedom. And, and like I said, I could live to be 99 years old and there'll still be veils that the Lord would want to lift off my eyes because I don't have the full understanding of Jesus. It's, it's, it's bottom, there, you know, you could never plumb the depths. You don't get to the bottom of all his knowledge of how he would want us to live. So it's a rich engagement to try, to try to learn more about what he wants for us. You'll never run out of material. Isn't that amazing? People hear you say that, and they, they have a hard time understanding it if they're not saved. But the dynamic of the Spirit means that there's multiple ways of understanding the truth of the Bible and multiple ways of applying it. And what he really doesn't want is that religious spirit, that, that rigor mortis of death that happens. Your body stiffens when you die, and all of a sudden God's trying to have you be pliable in his hands to use you in different ways, and you're like, oh, no, that can't be you, Lord. I know you told me to kill my son, so I have to do what you told me. Yeah, but I'm giving you another order now, and I'm telling you not to kill your son. <laughs> A proceeding word. So this is what Paul says again, back to 2 Corinthians 3. What was once glorious, or was glorious, no longer holds any glory because of the increasingly greater glory that replaced it doesn't mean that we throw out the Old Testament, okay? People get confused about this, so be really careful. He's not saying that. He's saying that the Old Testament was there to show us that there is a law and that in our own strength, we cannot follow that law. All have sinned and fall short of being that obedient lover of God. Love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I can't do that in my own natural ability. We fall short because of that sin that we inherited, okay? So it's not that we're throwing out the Old Testament. It's that some of it's been fulfilled and some of it is there to teach us. 
That's what it's called, a schoolmaster to, to teach us. So we don't have to eat kosher anymore, we're told in the New Testament, just as one example. All right, so it's an increasingly greater glory that's living inside of us. And here it is. The moment one turns to the Lord with an open heart, the veil is lifted. And they see. Here comes a heavy one. Now, the Lord I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit, and wherever he is Lord, there is freedom. Hmm. That's a little different than the way most of us heard it. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But this is saying wherever he is Lord, <laughs> there is freedom. Ouch. Say ouch. <laughs> I know a lot of you are getting what I'm going to say is because it's not automatic. Because just because you got saved, there might be areas in your life where he's not fully Lord. Your mouth. <laughs> your closet. That would be for the girls, not so much for the guys. It's worse when it's the guys. Oh, I won't even go there. That's just too traumatic. Come back, Holy Spirit. Right? Oh, man. There's a lot of areas of our lives. Forgiveness. Like, if we don't have, a, if we don't have forgiveness down well, then he might not be Lord because we, we're still holding a grudge or, or we still want to see... Uh, vengeance against somebody and he said vengeance is mine right so there's a lot of ways our finances could be a, a, an idol we could still be trusting in our finances I heard a great saying from Bill Johnson he said how much is enough right when it comes to money because you have business people that make a lot of money and, they, and they'll say that well how much is enough and he likes to turn it around and say how much is too much and when you have too much that means you're trusting in the money instead of trusting in God so the amount changes for everybody. It's different for all of us. But however much causes you not to trust God anymore. Because, but for God, you're not even alive today, right? So don't make it an idol. But look, wherever he is Lord, there's freedom. <laughs> oh, this is the rest of our lives. Wherever he's Lord, there's freedom. You could, you know, our friend Peter Wagner wrote a book about 17 different ways he changed his mind over things that he was teaching. And he was doing PhD students at Fuller Theological Seminary. They're not supposed to change their mind. They can't call their students and say, hey, by the way, that book I wrote, I change it, read the new version because I changed my opinion. But that's paradigm shift. He was teaching against Holy Spirit. The Lord opened his eyes that it was real and that he repented to his credit. He repented and said, no, look, there's another way of looking at this. Nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. And then verse 18, I like to quote this often. It says, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. You could kind of hear Alan say that in his testimony today, that when he first got here, things weren't making so much sense. But then as he kept listening and hearing and, and touching his spirit, the three years that went by, I was contemplating the Lord's glory. And, and I have an unveiled face now because it's okay for me. I got a prophetic word. I'm not seeing it come to pass. But now I'm realizing why I'm not seeing it come to pass. And I can go after this thing. And I have people here who care that don't have an agenda when it comes to the counseling, you know, that piece about the prayer counseling. It's like whatever it takes, as long as you're doing what we're asking you to do. Like we can't keep enabling you if you're not willing to work it. But if you're willing to work it, keep coming back. Because you will see results. But you know what they say in AA, it only works if you work it. <laughs> What's happening? We're contemplating the Lord's glory, and we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Okay? So that increase in glory is the opposite of what Moses experienced. Religion will grind you into powder. Because you can't do all the law. You can't keep up with it. It's there to tell you you can't do it. It's there to, to pin you like a wrestler and say, give up. <laughs> you can't do this. And they needed that to know that. So now it's like this posture right here on our knees, serving. You want to be great in the kingdom? Serve. Don't look for the big ministry. Don't look for the big name. You just have something to say. Listen to me. And, and that's when you'll get the big name. That's when people will seek you out if you want it to last. And he's looking for fruit that remains. Amen? All right. So this is not going to be one of my three-hour sermons. But I just have a couple more verses and then a handout. <laughs> Thank you for your mercy triumphs over judgment. <laughs> the next chapter, 4 in 2 Corinthians, says, even if our gospel message is veiled, it's only veiled to those who are perishing. 
that should cause a twinge of love in your heart towards people who are perishing and cause you to say, you know what? I'm going to cast uh, this fear to the wind and I'm going to go talk to this person about the Lord. Because if I keep going year after year without ever saying anything, they're perishing. Their minds have been blinded by the God of this age, leaving them in unbelief. Their blindness keeps them from seeing the, dis the day spring light of the wonderful news of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the divine image of God, right? Veil. There's a veil over their eyes. They can't see it. You can see it. You ask the Lord, what's the combination to the lock of their heart? How can I speak to them in a way that that veil will be lifted? For God who said all the way back, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, let brilliant light shine out of the darkness. That light has cascaded into us, right? He's cascaded his light into us, the brilliant dawning light of the glorious knowledge of God as we gaze into the face of Jesus Christ. That doesn't make sense to an unbeliever. It makes a whole lot of sense to us, doesn't it? That's what I was talking about. You're, you're given this portion of light from Christ that never runs out. And the more dark people you're with, and I don't mean dark in, in that they're evil people, they just don't know the Lord. They still have a veil over their eyes, but that light is getting soaked into them. And they're wanting to know what you know and why you're different than the other people that they talk to. And Latoya, you know, again, she just talked, used some of that language, like, don't go on any interviews. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say this, but don't take another job for three weeks. Like, wink, wink. It's like, there's favor on your life, and I know there's favor on your life. And, and she wasn't haughty about it. She just knew she could rest in that place of, of her relationship with the Father who was helping her find that favor, the glorious light of the face of Jesus. All right, I'm just going to end with a commentary and then the handout that I gave you quickly. It says, with Jesus, God's new covenant comes into being, okay? Say new covenant, please. All right, new covenant. Not, not the old veil that Moses had to wear where the light was fading, but there's this new covenant now where you are the power source. Holy Spirit's living on the inside of you by virtue of you saying yes to Christ. You can't say yes to Christ without Holy Spirit being part of that transaction, right? So if you're, if you're a Christian, you have Holy Spirit, all right? The gospel, I'm, yeah, God's new covenant came into being. The gospel isn't about a different God. It's about the same creator God bringing new life and new light into the world. So what he's saying is the same light that God spoke out of the chaos in Genesis, let there be light, is the same light that lives on the inside of you. So like I said, when Linda's down her job and she's witnessing to these unsafe people, light's coming out of her. They might reject it. And that's okay. If they reject it, so be it. But they still caught a little bit more of it. And their tank is getting filled up with some more light. <laughs> It's about the same creator God bringing new life and light into his world. The light that blinded Paul on the road to Damascus. The light that suddenly shone in people's hearts when Paul went around announcing the gospel of Jesus was like that light at the very beginning, a creation of the world. It's a light which is gone, John says in John 1, 5, it shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not been able to put it out. <laughs> so no matter how hard he tries, he can't put it out. You got that light on the inside of you. So would you look at that handout that you have in your bulletin real quick? It says the coronation of the king, and that might be where Trisha got that word earlier. And uh, again, this is an ongoing process as we're Christians. Where the spirit is Lord, there is freedom. <laughs> as opposed to where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Where the spirit is Lord in my life, then there's freedom. So this is Psalm 2 in the Passion Translation. And I'm guessing a lot of you probably are familiar with it, even if you don't know off the top of your head. It's got some very well-quoted New Testament quotes, Psalm 2. Peter in the book of Acts says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing against you, Lord? But there's also this wonderful language in the end of Psalm 2. It says, kiss the sun, right? What a beautiful picture that is, that we can kiss the sun, that we can be in relationship with him. So I can't go too far into Psalm 2 right now, but it's worth meditating on. That's why I wanted to give it to you. And the beginning is, it says, the nations speak. And, and Brian Simmons took a little liberty here, and he, and he said, there's four acts to this psalm. Act 1, you see it? Nations speak. Act 2, God speaks. Act 3, the Son speaks. Act 4, the Holy Spirit speaks. 
Take it for what, what you want. I'm saying that it resonated with me as I was studying. And it's a great way to look at it. Because what does the world say? Get off my back, God. I don't want you telling me what to do with my body. It's my body and I can do what I want. Yeah, you can cry too. <laughs> the nations speak. How dare the nations plan a rebellion? Their foolish plots are futile. Look at how the power brokers of the world rise up to hold their summit as the rulers scheme and confer together against Yahweh and his anointed king. And this is what they speak. Let's come together and break away from the creator. Once and for all, let's cast off these controlling chains of God and his Christ. That's what the rebellion of the world does. It tries to get you to fight against God's rulership over your life. But that's why the kingdom teaching is so valuable. It's not about the kingdom of heaven when you die and go to heaven. It's like, no, God's kingdom is available to you right now. You can step into a new form of government, the government of God. And wherever he rules, there's freedom. Wherever you're still letting the flesh rule or you're still letting the worldly thinking rule, there's not freedom. But that should be good news to you because it's still within your control. You might be fearful to have to try to change, but it's worth it to face that fear. Then God speaks in Act 2, which is verse 4. God enthroned merely laughs at them when they say, "Come, let's come together and break away from the Creator. <laughs> he laughs at them. That's a great picture, isn't it? The Sovereign One mocks their madness. <laughs> then with fierceness of his, uh, of his fiery anger, he settles the issue and terrifies them to death with these words. I myself have poured out my king on Zion, my holy hill. So I just want you to look this as a personal reflection and say, who's the king on your hill? Is it Jesus? And could it be that he's the king of your salvation, but maybe in other areas he's not ruling the way he wants to? Yes, it is. There's no horrible shame in admitting that. This is not an easy way to live. It requires discipline. Requires you having the, the strength of character and courage to say no to things that the world wants to put on you, your family wants to put on you. A, a lot of traditions that, that carry power that you might have to say, look, I respect the tradition, but I'm under a different government now. This is the authority in my life, and it won't allow me to do what you're asking me to do, and I'm not condemning you for it. I'm not acting like I'm better than you. I'm having a hard enough time keeping my own life together. I don't need to tell you how to live your life. <laughs> People who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Like, we all know these things, right? Fingers pointing back at you. We'll have to do that. And then the sun speaks. Verse 7. I will reveal the eternal purpose of God. For he has decreed over me, you are my favored son. And as your father, I've crowned you as my king eternal. Today I became your father. Ask me to give you the nations and I will do it. And they shall become your legacy. Your domain will stretch to the ends of the earth and you will shepherd them with unlimited authority, crushing their rebellion as iron rod smashes jars of clay. All right, so that means you can trust Jesus. This is a good government. All right, he is a benevolent leader, a, a sovereign ruler who has your best interests at heart. That doesn't mean he doesn't have boundaries. There's boundaries on your behavior, but you know they've fallen in pleasant places for us. That's right out of the Psalms. There's structure. There's structure in being a Christian, yes. There's structure in anything that's going to hold something valuable. There has to be structure. If there's a river flowing, you have banks on the river. When you take away the banks, the structure, it's a swamp. I don't want to be a swamp for God. And then the Holy Spirit speaks. Listen to me, all you rebel kings and all you upstart judges of the earth. Learn your lesson while there's still time. Now, you could say this to parts of your personality, couldn't you? <laughs> Just giving you a minute to think about it. Am I in rebellion in some area? Am I still holding on to an old structure because I'm afraid to change? Listen, you rebel kings. <laughs> All you upstart judges of the earth, learn your lesson while there's still time. Serve and worship the awe-inspiring God. Recognize his greatness and bow before him. 
trembling with reverence in his presence. Fall face down before him and kiss the sun before his anger is roused against you. Remember that his wrath can be quickly kindled, but many blessings are waiting for all who turn aside to hide themselves in him. So that's something you could use in your own altar time. Um, the other side, I'll just read the top part, and then we'll end. Actually, I didn't give it to you on there, but it's on the slide. So if you just put that last slide up, and then we'll end. You could stand, actually. Can you lift your hands? It's a great sign of surrender, isn't it? Can you read that? It's hard to read, but at the top it says the war for your altar. All right? There's a war for your altar. This is your personal altar time with the Lord. The devil wants to keep you off your knees. He doesn't want you spending time in the Word. He doesn't want you focusing and saying three times a day, I'm going to get down on my knees. He wants you caught up in all the distractions of the world. Our men's group was reading one of uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, stories from the screw tape letters. And the senior devil was telling the ju junior devil, just keep them distracted. That's all you have to do. Don't let them think about what's reality. And man, I'll tell you, that was true when C.S. Lewis wrote it 70 years ago. It's really true today. No, you make a decision. Nothing is keeping me away from my altar. It's the most important thing I can do. As soon as I get hung up on myself and I think I've got this, that's a plan for the enemy. It's pride. No, it's every day I'm going to get down on my knees. So that war for your altar in the middle there says it's ever shifting. There's an old government that wants to rule, but there's a new government that God's making available. I can be a lover of the law or I can live by the law of love. And that's what this backside is, okay? This just goes down on either side and it shows you, you want to be a lover of the law? Okay. With the measure you judge, it's going to be measured back to you. Or do you want to extend grace, mercy, triumphs over judgment? Be careful about being legalistic. Moses had a fading glory. Holy Spirit gives us increasing glory. We can be independent or we can be interdependent. And I'm just asking you to trust me on this one. It's, I choose to be interdependent with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, my church. I need church. All right, I'm, you don't even have to say this part with me. I'm just telling you right now. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against the ecclesia, against the structure that he put into the world. We need each other, church. Don't just sit home and watch it online. Look people in the eye. Develop discernment. Get prayer. It's really important. We have prayer here pretty much after every service, either prophetic or prayer, because we don't want anybody to feel like you're leaving here with an, uh, an unmet need, okay? And look, just could you pray for our church? Because we're, we're moving in eight weeks. That's going to be a lot of transition. We don't want anybody getting upset about something that they don't like, but do you ever try to please everybody? <laughs> it doesn't work too good, does it? So look, I know I'm loved by the Father. I'm going to tell you I'm going to do the best I can. I promise there won't be any lazy stuff going on, but will I? every decision I make make you happy? Probably not. Would you forgive me now in advance? You know, like it's the opposite when your mother would hit you and say, you didn't do anything, but that's just for the next thing you're going to do. <laughs> you're forgiving me in advance. So thank you for that grace. Eight weeks is not a lot of time, all right? So we got a lot to do. And I'm not, I'm not stressed about it. I'm just saying pray. Please pray, okay, that the will of God gets done. It, I know the devil is trembling that this move is really going to make a big difference, a big difference. A lot of people's lives are already being touched. All right, so let's just, let's just make a declaration to end it. We started with a declaration that I am living proof that my God is on the move. I'm a walking talking, living, breathing, hallelujah. Ha. So look at somebody near you. You are living proof that God is on the move. You are a walking, talking, living, breathing, hallelujah. <laughs> you got to say that with an exclamation point, don't you? And look, none of us are perfect. None of us have everything. If we did, then that would give us pride, wouldn't it? 
So he keeps us on our knees to keep us humble, but he loves us and he loves us and he wants us on this upward trend, like constantly finding favor. And it says it delights him to see us, his servants, to prosper. So I just want to speak that over you as well. And, and just say this last part with me. I choose to live by the law of love, not to be a lover of the law. Lord, detox my system of any religious cells or viruses. I want to be contagious with your Holy Ghost, with the crown of heaven. <laughs> Let me be a contagious carrier of your glory to everybody that I meet. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, Lord, I just want to bless your congregation. I know there's a lot of new people here. I'm not sure if everybody here is born-again Christian. If you're not, you heard a lot of amazing testimonies today. This is just a regular thing that happens when you're serving God. It's not some empty promise. It's a real promise. He's real. Amen, church? He's real. You can trust him with the government of your life. So we'll just say a real a prayer that will allow you to invite him in. If you've never done this before, just say it out loud with us, okay? Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. And I make a decision today that I surrender the government of my life to the kingdom of God, to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. I have run away from you, but I'm stopping. I'm turning around, and I'm going to run towards you. But will you forgive me? I ask for your forgiveness. I repent of the sin in my life, and I ask you, to empower me and strengthen me to live in obedience to the way you want me to live. Help me to understand what that is and surround me with people who love me in your kingdom and can help me to walk on this life-giving journey that you have for me. I accept you, Lord, Jesus Christ, as the Lord of my life today. Empower me and fill me with your spirit to serve you the rest of my life and to spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. And everybody here said that prayer. If they're a Christian, they said that prayer one way or another sometime in their life, whether it was in a church service or not. But then they made a, a, a statement out into public. So if you have it in you, don't just sit in your seat right now. Come forward. Make a decision and say, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and keep it to myself. I made an important decision today, and I want other people to know. So I'm getting out of my seat, and I'm coming up to that altar. Anybody here never said that prayer before? Church needs to start inviting some people to church that don't know the Lord, huh? Amen. All right. Well, we rejoice with you that you're going to have an awesome week. Be bountifully blessed as you go forth this week. We'll see you during the week. Bless you. Prayer ministry team? No, no.